members of the public who wish to address the Board of Education at this time. If not, then let's go on to board member comments or reports. Board members, do any of you have comments or reports? I would just like to um, commend Mathis on the exceptional job he's done so far. Um, a lot of the decisions that he's made um, supported very well. He's made a lot of good decisions and uh, shared information with us that shows us he's doing exactly what the entry plan was going to be and the type of person he is. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I attended a, um, a uh, soccer game last week and got to use the new park bench that they put out there from the wing, or from the booster club. And I'd like to see some of the other clubs booty up some money and get a couple more out there because it was very convenient to have that. And um, opening day was awesome. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Carol? Yeah, I just want to also say what a nice opening it was. And I think you were just very well received by the staff. Thank you. And hopefully, you know, now that we're in, they're coming to you and you'll meet more of them. And if this doesn't ever pan out, you could be a good dance instructor. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Might not pay as well. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other board member comments? <laughs> if not, then let's turn to the superintendent. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure. It truly has. Uh, for the superintendent's report tonight, I have a couple of things. But before we get into our curriculum and instruction piece and our business administration piece, just I would like to uh, uh, introduce to the board a couple of folks. Uh, first, we have Stephanie Cornell, who is uh, with us tonight. We have other teachers on our agenda for our probationary appointments uh, and also uh, uh, substitute appointments, but Stephanie's with us. She's our new science teacher over at the middle school, if I remember correctly, probationary. So Stephanie, I just wanted you to just say hi to the board, if you could. Uh, she came tonight so that you, you could see, uh, put a name to the face uh, as we go to, to vote on uh, personnel uh, assignments for this year. And then also, uh, we have Miss Amy Shannon. Uh, Amy has uh, just, what a pleasure uh, to work with so far. She's been into the school, the high school, and she is uh, the recommended candidate that I'm recommending to the board for the uh, high school assistant principal um, coming to us from Pittsburgh with lots of experience uh, and also uh, that experience includes not just in the classroom but also uh, in, in, in excuse me in, I can't even speak an administrative role uh, in the last year so just a pleasure to to have her here and board uh, I just want her to say hi to everybody um, and so you got to see her she brought her kids and her husband as well tonight. <laughs> so uh, I know it's been a journey for you all, and we welcome you certainly to Wayne. And, and uh, with that being said, uh, you don't have to stay for the meeting tonight because <laughs> I know you have little kids, but we just wanted everybody to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited to, to join the Wayne team, and I've learned so much in the last couple of weeks and just really look forward to um, continuing the journey. Excellent. Thank you. And you might not know this, but Amy is, her classes are done early at Pittsburgh, and she's been going in to Pittsburgh and coming over here. It's a couple afternoons a week, she's been getting her feet wet before we even start. So she's, she's uh, she'll be a hard worker, I know that. And I think the official start date is the 28th, if I remember correctly. Uh, and so uh, we looked uh, from last year. And so uh, Joe tonight is going to spend some time going over our student data. Uh, and our New York State results for our grade three through eight students uh, tonight. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about the transition program that was put into place over the summer uh, to help students and to address some of the challenges that students are facing around the Common Core. So we'll spend some time uh, just listening to Joe a little bit. Thank you. I know it's always a pleasure to listen to Joe. So. <laughs> <laughs> Before I get into the data I have with you, I just want to remind you about some of the data that I did share with you at your retreat. Um, at your retreat, we had all the regents test results um, for our high school and, and middle school students who took those exams. We shared that data with you, and we disaggregated that data into some of our um, bigger subgroups. So we shared with you that data in terms of how did our, all of our students do, how did our students with an IEP do, how did our students from lower socioeconomic 
um, settings do, and then how did our females and males do? So we pulled that data apart for you so that you can see not just the big number, but how some of our subgroups are doing. And I think you'll see <coughs> that we'll be focusing some of our attention on some of those subgroups in our school improvement plans over the course of the year. I'll pull some of that subgroup data out for you tonight as well with our 3.8 data. We'll keep mainly a big picture we'll look at 3.8 stuff. Um, but tonight as I, as I kind of go over how we're doing in 3.8, that's kind of a, a tougher question than it has been with all of the opt-outs, which is also data I shared with you this summer. We knew how many kids opted out of our 3.8 exams in August, <coughs> in uh, July and August. I don't remember when the retreat was. We just didn't know how they did because the state didn't have the cut score. So I'll share with you. I'll remind you of some of that. And I'll also just try to give you a little peek into what we do with the data. And I'll do that um, through the ELA standards. We to kind of to, to use the, the data or interpret the data, but it doesn't prevent us from doing so. So tonight I'm going to share the data. I'm going to give you three looks at the data to kind of help us answer that question, how are we doing? About that proficiency rate, those are the two numbers that we're talking about. Yellow is uh, yellow is two, and and uh, blue is one. Now, the previous commissioner defined level two as, well, not uh, not at the standard, on pace with intervention to meet the standard. So he wanted to kind of turn down some of the concern around that. And you'll recall that when I shared with you the Regents exam results, I also shared with you how we did on the ELA um, assessment. We gave that assessment to our accelerated students in 10th grade, and we did have a 100% passing rate and uh, about a third mastery, I don't remember exactly. but So we did well with that first, that first assessment, although it was with our accelerated students, um, much better than we did with our accelerated students in algebra. So that's, that's kind of a good sign. The third graph it, um, is... <coughs> Uh, it shows uh, the proficiency rate with our opt-outs. So what we did with that is we said, okay, for the students who didn't take the exam in 2015, um, if they took the exam in 2014, what was their score? And let's carry that score forward. It's not a perfect science. We don't know what they would have done in 2015. But what we heard a lot of is, oh, we're losing all our threes and fours. And Wayne Central didn't just hear that. Around the state, um, people were saying that. So. I just would like to, to show you that in 2014, our proficiency rate was 38%, and we were roughly, with rounding, closer to 39%, but we were, we were basically 38% in 2015, threes and fours. And when we factored in those, those opt-out rates, um, I was a little bit surprised to see that actually our proficiency rate, had those kids taken the test and scored the same, did dip a little down to 35%. So it, um, one of the things that was said um, by the Board of Regents was that they felt that, that students who were opting out were, were really representative of the whole. In other words, it wasn't one particular score band that was opting out. It was ones were as equally as likely to opt out proportionately as twos as, as kids who scored threes and fours. And so we, relatively, we see that in the data, although we have a few more twos and a few less fours. So, shows our 13, 14 for all students. We have 38% passing rate. You see that that says 39% passing rate. It's just for uh, 14, 15. That's just a rounding thing there. It's just basically where we are. Um, and then when we figure in the opt-outs, we were at 35%. But our students with IEPs significantly underperformed the mean. And you can see that at 3% this year, 4% last year, 1% um, actually achieving mastery, which is an increase from the year before. But we've definitely got some work to do in this regard. And the one thing I would say to our students uh, with IEPs is that <clears throat> we, we had the same challenge uh, 12 or 15 years ago um, when, when the assessments were updated. And we, we focused intently on our students with disabilities, and we all but um, eradicated level one for our, for our kids here at Wayne. So we're up to that challenge. We know it's just going to take some focus and intention, intentionality, and it, it's a you know it's a big lift. But I think I think we'll be there. The research shows that students who come from low socioeconomic um, backgrounds underperform their grade level peers, and you can see from this uh, second set that that ours <coughs> did as well, with uh, 20% in 2014 achieving proficiency, 
up a couple of percent this year to 22 percent, but significantly below the mean in the year. And then our, our girls, our, our females, did outperform our males this year. And you can see almost in every case that when we add in the opt-outs, the proficiency drops just a little bit. The third way I want to show you the data is I'm just, I just picked a grade level, and I picked sixth grade because they had the best improvement, so I think it's nice to celebrate a little bit uh, with you as well. But this is looking at what we call cohort data. So in 2015, our sixth graders took the exam. Um, I think <clears throat> that third graph shows how those sixth graders did. So we had 48% who reached proficiency, or levels three and four, and we had 88% of our kids fall into levels two, three, and four. Now the way this trend data, and we have it for all the grade levels, um, the one thing I will say is the RIC and the state website, they've really increased the data that's available to us in different forms and different ways. So um, it, it is, it's becoming much more user friendly to us and, and much more, <coughs> we're much better able to apply it to what we're doing. So you take that same group of students. What's represented here are 98 students who took the exam in 2015, 14, and 13. So nobody would show up on this graph. You wouldn't show up on this graph if you didn't, if we didn't have the state didn't have data for you in all three years. And so you can see how a cohort kind of progressed. So in this case, in 2013, this group was at 32% proficiency. And that's that year that they moved to cut score. Uh, the first year that they really significantly increased the cut score, uh, or what it, what it took to be a three and a four, and even a two for that matter. Um, in 2014, we were at 42%. And in 2015, this cohort, the same group of kids, was at 48%. So in the first graph, I show you um, just overall, year to year, and then we bring in the opt-outs. The second graph shows you it disaggregated against <coughs> some populations. The third graph just kind of gives you a picture about how we could follow a group up through and actually um, see how those kids have. Uh, so right here in front of you, you have, an, it, <coughs> it's more meant for you just to kind of see what we would do as a staff in, in team meetings or with some of our new positions that we've added, uh, ELA and math coordinators is we would take a look at some of the standard men in fifth and are in sixth and seventy-two percent. So that might be a standard we might want to have a vertical conversation about. We're within a grade level for fourth grade. We might want to have a, a grade level discussion about how can we better help our kids to meet that standard. So the first thing we need is using compare contrast, cause and effect, first, second, third. Um, in fourth grade, you're explaining how the author uses reasons and evidence to support a particular point in the text. In fifth grade, you're adding to that, um, identifying which reasons, and I'll share just a few of them with you for each so you can kind of get a picture. You have to make a claim and find some evidence that supports that claim, but it's pretty linear. It's pretty one-to-one. -one. There's not, you're not selecting from a lot of different evidence. And so the sample answer, and this answer more, and to get you curious about the Aurora Borealis. For example, it says, what makes the different colors? It also says, why can they only be seen at night? So they would have shoot, they would have read a passage, and for each of the next couple of multiple choice questions I'll share with you, you can't answer them because I didn't give you the passage, but the kids read a passage, and then they have to answer the question. So in fourth grade, that the distractors or they, the the are not they're they're in the selection, and you have to really discern between um, what is the best evidence and what is just kind of tangible. The authors, the point the authors making in that paragraph, and then it's from second year <coughs> as a reward school, and that's because it is working very well to reduce uh, instructional gaps uh, in terms of outcomes with students, and so we also want to make sure we recognize that and share that with you tonight too. Okay. Okay, Joe. So the next uh, thing we're going to share with you is our summer transition program. And you'll re I'm going to invite um, Nicole McGarry and, and Chelsea Eaton up. Um, you'll recall that we, uh, you recall that we this past summer we were able to reintroduce summer program um, into our district. We had construction for the past two summers, so we got away from it. Some things that really challenged us were, you know, sending our special education 12-month students to other districts. That was a challenge. That was a challenge for us because we've always of those programs close. And we also had a number of programs that we did for our community and for our kids in the summer. 
So as an administrative team, when we looked at what programs to bring back, <clears throat> we didn't want to just uh, reinstitute what we did. We wanted to have a very real conversation about if we could if we could reintroduce one thing into our summer program, what would that be? What would and, and what would have the greatest impact for our kids? So after a lot of conversation, we talked about the importance of transition groups. And so we have we settled on a two to three, so entering third graders, entering sixth graders uh, program, and a credit recovery program at the high school. Tonight we're just going to talk to you about third and sixth, the third and sixth grade program. But I can tell you that the credit recovery program, we had 18 students out of 20 re uh, repair their credit, so to speak. And we know the importance of coming out of your freshman year with all your credits. Kids who do will graduate. Kids who don't really uh, kind of working with administrators to conceptualize the program, to think about the criteria. And so I think they had a fantastic experience. And I think more importantly, our kids had a fantastic experience. So I'll turn it over to you guys. And I'm Chelsea Eaton, and I have been at OP and OE. I've done fourth grade, kindergarten. I've also done third grade. I've done multi-age. I've kind of <laughs> bounced all over. Um, currently this year, I've taken on the new role as the math coordinator for this program might look like. We really, we knew the value in that we did not want our students to regress over, regress over the summer, knowing that that's such a, a struggle with students in reading and in math having two months off, coming back to school, and then having to reteach all of those skills, is, it's a battle every year that the teachers have to go through. So we, when we looked at grade levels we would focus on, second to third is a very, very big jump for students. Um, you're going into state testing from into third grade, and you, those kids don't have a ton of experience in second grade with the, the rigor and the tests that they are exposed to in third grade. Fifth to sixth. You're changing buildings. Actually, second and third, you're changing buildings too. If you're over at OP at OE, so we, you know, keeping that in mind too. Not only transitioning academically, but transitioning um, socially, emotionally. Those pieces all play a role. So that was a really awesome thing that we were able to get those fifth to sixth graders at the middle school and having some experience with with the building as well. Our focus was literacy and numeracy. Um, and when we when we went through the that process of you know, identifying what students who to target. We we took a lot of different um, components into into consideration. Um, the teacher recommendation, um, student classroom performance, assessment data. We wanted to make sure it was all inclusive. We were including not only our general ed students but our students <coughs> with disabilities as well. Um, we we really wanted to make sure that we were targeting. A, a range of students, not just the students that were struggling significantly, you know, academically, but with students that we knew maybe were just on grade level, but we're, we're going to probably have some regression over the summer, and we wanted to make sure that we, we prevented that. This was the piece that we gave to our second grade teachers as well as our fifth grade teachers that they filled out on all of their students. We allowed this to become something that was a criteria built for not just you know, our lowest 10th percentile or our lowest 25th. We wanted to look at all of our kids in a whole and compare them across the grade and across both of the buildings. Um, so the, she said, okay, my friends, we're gonna write for seven minutes. I'm gonna set the timer and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna do this. And one of the kids raised his hand and it was a student that went to summer program. And he was like, I can write for 25 minutes. I learned how to do that this summer with Mrs. Hurts. And it was just the coolest thing to see, like, that he had felt good as a writer and that he had stamina as a writer. And you could see a bunch of the kids raise their hand and say, I can do that too. I can write for 20 minutes. I can write for this, you know. And these are kids that don't necessarily come in with a lot of stamina for writing, you know. So that was something really, really awesome to see. And you can see some of the other quotes that some of the students you know, in math we had so much fun. I love that we got to switch classes. Um, we were able to write about ourselves. You know, so much of what happens a lot of times is we're writing about our reading or we're writing um, in response to something. They don't get a lot of time to write a fantasy or to write um, a personal narrative. So I think it was really exciting and, and a different experience for the kids and they had a lot of fun. So. Um, some of those initial grade level meetings and determining AIS grouping. So we've shared the information that we collected with classroom teachers, 
reading staff, other AIS support staff, so that they can use that information, very, very recent information, not from June, you know, from August, that can help them to guide their groups. Um, we're also looking at just some of the strengths and weaknesses. We know attendance was, was a bit of a struggle. We know kind of that first week getting things up and running was, it, it what made things go as smoothly as we had wanted to. There's the transportation, there's all those things that you just have to look at, you know, what went well and what didn't, and what can we do better. Um, and then also just thinking about exploring some of those other transition years. We know that it's not just second to third, it's not just second to sixth, you know. What other years can we look at to focus in on for transitioning and, and preventing regression and really giving them that push to get them ready for the next grade level? Thank you. Has Tell any me questions? if you guys had as much fun as the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work, ladies. A lot of work. Thank you for doing this for our students. It's, it, that is, just putting that together and trying the school and teaching and everything. Project. That's a lot. Um, parents, you know, hopefully, maybe, do we assess at Wayne, like, with F&P in the spring, winter, yep. or fall, winter, spring? Yes. Yeah. Maybe with those, with that winter data, we can start to look at, you know, kids who are reading, you know, so much below grade level and start to put the ball in place for, so parents can, you know, set the dates and sure your child will most likely be recommended. These are the dates, you know, so that maybe they can pull out what they got, their child made growth. It would be better if they could do it again another time or something. And we're hoping now that the program is, is familiar to the district, to the teachers, and to the community that that it is something that is looked at as addressing next year and having a program next year. And so sharing that at parent-teacher conferences, like you say, in the winter will hopefully really boost some of the morale of the program and getting more involvement in the program. Coming from working in an elementary school, I am surprised that over the 16 years I've been in elementary, just from my perch in the office, how many times I have heard the kids, oh, got to start reading again. I haven't read since we got out of school in June. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids, that happens. Mm -hmm. They don't see a book from June to September. You're not going to remember and you are going to regress. So, mm -hmm. thank you. I, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, and actually, the first sure. one is for Joe. Can we start a new cohort to look at our test results? So that to, yeah. to follow these kids going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, I would ask you to, uh, to if, if there are things that you need. Um, we started the July 13th, July 13th that week, and then they went to August 13th was their final day. Mm -hmm. We started the ESY the week right after. We to see if there was some regression in those two weeks from the from August, and that might be another option of just trying to shift it closer to the start of school, making it more like a camp, you know, a prep camp, getting ready for a school. Because I do think they'll probably, we saw it on long week. When you go through the change order process, you can use the allowance to keep the project moving and keep it on schedule. So that money is in the bid, the award of contract for each of the primes. If we don't use up the entire allowance, then because it's part of the contract, we have to do a deduct change order to get the money back away from their contract and into the project. So that's why you see tonight a bunch of the uh, change orders are deducts for the roofing contract that didn't use all their allowance. Um, I think the uh, HVAC contract that didn't use all theirs. So there's change orders crediting the unused portion back to the project. Somewhere around there. I think yeah, my fingers are right. Yeah, okay. Right. One thing that I did notice in their billings was an overtime charge billed in uh, July, billed out in July, so it must have happened prior to that, for overtime to make sure that we were done by the opening of school. It seems awful early for that kind of a charge to come through. And it looked like it ate up a lot of that uh, contingency money. Right. It meant there was decisions made throughout that summer um, to make sure that we were able to get the schedule done, uh, to make sure that we opened school on time. I mean, that was one of our um, prime objectives, to make sure that we had everything as far along as we could construction-wise and not delay um, the opening of school or affect the instructional process. So decisions were made. Um, I don't know exactly the timing of the particular one you're talking about, but um, I remember especially like the with the session two was a date on the, on the Right request, so that means it happened well, probably they a the month and a week prior. Last year, not for this year, because this year we approved. So you all uh, 
kind of material uh, tickets that were received for that. And as I recall, it was in the end of August, early September of uh, 2014. <laughs> um, I think another question that came up was um, some of the costs of some of the items, and I just want to, you know, remind you that each change order and each allowance is reviewed by our construction manager to make sure that it's in line. The thing about change order is it's not in the competitive environment, so um, the cost tends to be a little bit higher. But we also are paying paying prevailing wage. And in the change order environment, they're allowed to, on top of the prevailing wage cost, put on 15% profit and overhead. So, um, and the other thing about that, um, sometimes you might wonder, geez, why couldn't our guys do something that might seem like a smaller item? But when you're under construction, like for instance, a concession stand, it doesn't really become our responsibility until substantial completion. So if our guys go in there during the construction process to do some small work, we run the risk of voiding warranties and having the contract to say, well, you went in there before we turned it over to you, even though you're doing these things, and, you know, so you can get into that back and forth. So, you know, um, you have to be careful with that. Right. Um, uh, I think, Dennis, you had a question um, about the cost of the window. So it was a lighting and also a ventilation piece. Yeah, it just seemed um, to be $8,000 yeah, for the window. It, yeah, that it did seem like a lot of money, but <laughs> because, of the, because of the size of the window. They had put a window in the yeah, support the way the wall top above top. and yeah. whatnot. So, um, but in change orders, that they are not in a bidding environment. They are a little, you know, high. A little bit higher. Correct. And, and the one thing to add to that, you know, in terms of the overall cost, I think I shared with the board, uh, you know, while some of these costs are a little bit higher than the norm, it, we kind of get equaled out in the long run because we do get aid on the, on this project. Correct. Right. So some of that cost, it kind of comes back to us as we, as we move forward as well. It's out of one pocket and then another, but that's that's the system that we operate on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you have other questions about the change orders. Just based upon your experience as a construction manager, the change orders seem large to us, but this is the first construction project this board has gone through. Based on your experience, are the number of change orders out of line? From what I've seen, no. Uh, other than your problems with the concession stand, which is the whole a lot of the stuff with the remodeling project, you find a lot of unforeseen uh, conditions. And uh, from what I've learned in the past uh, eight months working on this project, uh, there were a number of unforeseen conditions. And that's where primarily the cost we're at. Thank you. And I think isn't there a percentage that change orders should not exceed was a 5% mm -hmm. of the total or and actually, through our uh, forensic engineer, you know, uh, through everything we did the session stand, he looked at the overall number of change orders, and even though it seemed, because it came in large bunches of stacks, <laughs> really, we're, we're actually within that parameter. I bet you've been over carrying them today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I answered all your questions. Um, Are we past punch list time? Yes. We're down to like almost a mm -hmm. mil? Well, I'm the first phase for the private junior warranty period right now. Um, we still have a couple little punch list items to take care of here in the district office, but uh, we are working on that. So. And like the trailers are, I see, are all gone. Everything is out of the basement. We were down there last Correct. week. Correct. And it looks like it's pretty empty down there. Correct. From the general contractor, really encompass work that was part of their bid for work they did to fix their original work, which wasn't done right. So we've already rejected that. They don't agree with that, but that'll be part of the negotiation. So when you back that up, Carla brings the number down to um, a little under 200000 And how much of it have we recovered between everybody? Um, Some of it I know we're not going to recover because it was us. 25 and 90 uh, we recovered, and then we kicked in plus 25. And with Welliver, what is your feeling on their culpability? Um, I mean, we feel very strongly that they did have a role that they played. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they didn't protect the site as much as they should have. The 
the mesh that was in the slab was not, not the spec, that was not pulled up. You know, how much that actually contributed to the slab heaving. That's, uh, I, you may not want to put a dollar figure on that. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that, Carla, but I mean, clearly they, they had a, a role in that. And, you know, hopefully at the end of the process, what we pay them will fairly reflect them um, taking ownership because they did submit quite a few tickets that were not going to approve um, because of the work they needed to do to, to fix what they helped create. So we'll be, we'll, our plan is to meet with them short, very soon, Carla. And so again, this, this uh, tomorrow, Greg and there's a team of folks, uh, Joe, who was here, Joe Shields will be meeting as a team and we'll be kind of trying to figure out what that amount should be or shouldn't be. And, and Mark, I'm repeating. I have a motion to approve. Carla, second Dennis. All in favor, please signify. I do have a question on um, the hard box and uh, Sparks, what did they donate? Um, like a, it's the it's 226.65. Hard box donated some money towards uh, the cost for the Lego League Lego at Ontario Elementary and Sparks donated, I believe it was the backpack. 16 backpacks. 15 backpacks. 15 backpacks. For me? 15 backpacks. 15. And they were full of school supplies, which will help children that um, they found them in a wee moon tour. Right, yes. Couldn't, yeah. you know, uh, have everything they needed, it'll, it'll help them with that. Need. And obviously, yeah. mm -hmm. Kathy has the letters prepared, and I normally sign them after the meeting. Committee reports? Do we have any uh, committees to report at this point? Should we five o'clock before the first board meeting? Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, audit committee will be meeting a week from today on the 17th uh, in this office or in this room at uh, 5 30 p.m. Policy committee? Policy committee is kicking off the year September 24th, 5 o'clock, right here in the district office. Do we have any other committee reports? If not, under board president comments, I would like to. On behalf of the Board of Education, extend uh, condolences to the family of Kelly Burns, whose mother passed away this summer, and to Chris Schaefer, whose father recently passed away. Uh, also under Board President comments, uh, a week from tomorrow, Tim and I will be attending the New York State School Board's leadership uh, program at the Radisson in Rochester. Uh, while it's technically for uh, Board Presidents and Vice Presidents, they would allow anybody else to attend if any of you are to attend. So I'm sure Kathy would be glad to register you. And then lastly, we do have a need for another executive session. I will say to, to the public, you are welcome to stay, but I promise you when we come out of executive session, we will not be taking any action. So can I get a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, uh, personnel. personnel and uh, contract negotiation? Tim, second Phil, any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Have a good evening, folks.